We're going to talk about something near and dear to everybody's heart, money. Stacey. Right. Well, I want to actually go back in time because exactly 100 episodes before this one, uh, episode KR1555. So go to YouTube, look that up, Kaiser Report, episode 155. The title of the episode was called The Cantillon Monopoly because this is in the news today, what, 10 months later, eight months later. And the synopsis for episode 155 was... In this episode of Kai's Report, Max and Stacy discuss the history of the monopoly board that is the U.S. economy, whereby the fiat pyramid scheme started in 1971, only a few short years after the Civil Rights Act. Those who held all the assets in 1971 became fabulously wealthy compared to those without assets as the central bank began printing money furiously over the ensuing decades. That's the Cantillon effect. Whoever has all the assets, whoever's closest to the money printing, they get all the wealth, right? So this comes into effect because the New York Fed has finally conceded that Kaiser Report was right. They have issued a new study which finds the New York Fed says in a new research paper that easy monetary policy does little to cut racial income inequality, ultra easy monetary policy may not help reduce racial economic disparities anywhere near as much as many now believe. And we'll go into some of it, but in fact, it's not even, it's like, it doesn't help it at all. It causes the opposite. Right, that's right. Not only doesn't it not help it, but it causes racial inequality and wealth and gap inequality because you're substituting something that was not horrible money, that is to say the US dollar pre-1971 that at least had some ostensible tie to gold, was something that was completely horrible and in the establishment's hands in ways that would mitigate the effect of the equal rights movement of the 60s. When it looked like there would be more equal rights in America, central bankers very quickly said, wait a minute, we can't let this happen. Let's." Let's get off the gold standard and take control of the money supply, take control of the dollar, and this way we can keep our monopoly positions and not share anything. Right, so the important date is August of 1971. That is when the fiat pyramid scheme that is the current US dollar iteration started. Whoever had the assets at that time, whoever had the jobs at that time that were still linked to inflation, whoever got to be the generation whether it was the boomer generation versus now the Generation Z, uh, who are at the last stage of this pyramid scheme, or at that same time, you know, the, the racial inequality that did not get even the beginnings of the disintegration of that didn't happen until after the mid 60s. So they were already, they had been for hundreds of years cut out of owning the assets. So when the pyramid scheme started in 1971, whoever was there first, has the, enjoys the most wealth today. So that's why you see the, the pyramid scheme setup that we have now. The study that they did at the New York Fed, ultra easy monetary policy may not help reduce racial economic disparities anywhere near as much as many now believe. Of course, many are not Max and Stacy on Kai's report as we, as you can go back a hundred episodes and look that we said this, there is little reason to think that accommodative monetary policy plays a significant role in reducing racial inequities in the way often discussed, wrote economists Alina Barcher, Moritz Kuhn, Moritz Schulacher, and Paul Wachtel. And in fact, the paper released on Friday, on the contrary, very easy Fed policy may well accentuate inequalities for extended periods. <laughs> Right, uh, exactly right. Uh, the, the money printing and the central bank policies, as you point out, it is basically a pyramid scheme that came into existence in force in 1971. And the people who owned assets back then were able to ride the pyramid scheme for 45 years as more money is being printed and the value of those assets goes up, like Park Avenue apartments, like fine art like uh, chateaus. Uh, these are the things that are owned by the folks that started this pyramid scheme that are the purveyors of this pyramid scheme. And the racial inequality exacerbated. It got worse 
Um, and, and and also just to basically the divide between rich and poor in America is at its most extreme because of this pyramid scheme for this reason by design. Right. And it's by design, whether ill intentioned or not. That is the fact of this uh, fiat system that we have is the pyramid scheme nature of it and why we have to keep on expanding debt. If you look back to 1971 versus today, you see a huge pile of debt. But the other thing is that you'll see a lot of, say, the Democratic Party, the progressive side of, of politics says we need to end these wealth and income gaps between the sexes and the genders and between the races. So let's look at, you know, they'll often say they totally support the central bank and they totally support printing more money. You'll see by and large, it's the Democrats who will support that position in America because they say it, it helps, it helps black people with their jobs. It does show that in one way, but worse on the other side. So let's read this. While there is evidence that easy monetary policy helps lift employment for black Americans, it has a bigger impact on asset values, which benefits white Americans who are much wealthier on average and better positioned to benefit from the impact of stimulative monetary policy. The authors wrote, quote, an accommodative monetary policy shock exacerbates the wealth difference between black and white households because black households own less financial assets that appreciate in value. Compared with white families, the median black household has no stock holdings nor owns a house. By definition, any effect that monetary policy has on the price of such assets bypasses the majority of black households which is exactly what we said in episode 1555, is that because they did not have, the black households did not hold assets in the beginning of this pyramid scheme, that this is why their wealth gap is now at a, the gap is now bigger than it was pre-1968. Right, well, let's bring it, you know, simplify it down to what happened. So the progressives, the left wing, they say, hey, we got to uh, make this fairer. So here's the big pile of money. And we noticed that a lot of it's over here in the white people camp. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take 10% of it or so uh, via taxes, maybe. And we're going to move it over to the uh, lowest uh, economic spectrum of the economy. And the white people say, OK, that's cool. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to print up some more money and uh, we're going to print a trillion or five trillion. And we're going to give. Uh, the amount that you just suggested, 10% of the amount pre this new cram down or this new stock flotation, this new money printing over there to that pile over there. And we're going to keep the other 90%. And then the left wing politicians say, oh, that's great. And then a year or two later, they're like, wait a minute, you bamboozled me. You're exactly the same thing and nothing's changed. And they're like, white folks be saying, yeah, you're right. Let's do it. I tell you, let's print another five trillion. Okay. And then, just like you said, we're going to put this amount of money over there to help those folks. And we keep the other 90 percent. Well, right? That's the Cantillon effect. That is the Cantillon the, the effect. Cantillon effect. And they feel like um, let's spew money at the system. And spewing money is good because if we spew money to everybody, then the poor people will get it. But if the, the setup of the system of the entire country and all of the land and all of the assets and all the stocks are held mostly by the Jeff Bezos, by the Elon Musk, by those people in the world, and it's held by the top 0.1%, essentially, they own most of it. All that Cantillon effect goes into there. It's the same argument, by the it's the same effect. So they're saying print more money so that those people that we want to help over there uh, get some money. Okay, but they end up getting $1 of the new $100, where the, the wealthy get the 99 we see that with everything. We see that with the Cantillon effect, with the Fed money. We saw that with the CARES Act. It almost entirely went to, uh, you know, that was treasury money. That went almost entirely to wealthy people. And the same thing we saw, we see with the argument that the Democrats made under Bill Clinton is that let's send all of our jobs overseas because you know what? Getting Chinese people to make all these goods and services, well, they'll, it'll lower your costs at Walmart. And you don't want, like, you're not progressive if you don't want cheaper prices at Walmart, right? So, and yet their wages kept on going down while the asset prices kept going up. So this is the situation that Kai's report has been covering for the past 
11 years now. Right. Uh, it's exactly correct. It's a can tell the fact it's, you know, the, the important story here is why the progressives or the left wing are failing continuously to impact any social reform that would satisfy their objectives because they refuse to look at the money itself. Yes. They believe in the fiat money. They believe the central bank. They yes. believe Janet Yellen. They believe Ben Bernanke. They believe Jay Powell. They believe the words coming out of their mouth. And that's the first fail. And then every single fail comes after that, that foundational failure to understand the money itself. When it's not backed by anything, it's just paper and only a few people control it and they get to divvy the pie. So the Kintilin effect kicks in and they keep 90 cents of every dollar they print. That's not gonna change progressives ever. Okay. <laughs> But, you know, the point is as well that what we're seeing now under Biden, what will happen, what the progressives want, because the progressives are mostly, you know, upper middle class, upper class, elite class, sort of people who live in Washington, D.C. They live in New York City. They live in San Francisco. They live in Los Angeles. They live in Chicago. And what are those places? Property bubbles, right? They have property, high property prices high property taxes. And b before Trump, they for decades, they were able to write off their taxes. Anything above $10,000 in taxes on their property in Manhattan, they got to write it off against the federal taxes that they, they owed. It was very not progressive. So they they it was an unprogressive tax, a regressive tax, right? And now they want to bring it back in because all of these people in Manhattan who are like, oh, let's just print up some more money and give it to the people and drive up my asset price. And then I get a discount on my taxes. It's, a, it's the Bono effect, right? This is the way Bono does policy as well. He himself has set up his his uh, tax arrangements. So all of his uh, money flows to the Netherlands and Ireland and that double Dutch tax sort of sandwich thing. And, and they get tax discounts, but then they fly around the world getting Bill Clinton or Tony Blair and they're you know, the, the, the people after them to, uh, you know, impose higher taxes in order to help other people around the world. So this is the same thing you're seeing here because they're not fixing the taxes. It's, you see it in the race situation, you see it in the gender situation, and you see it in the generational thing that is now rising up. Right. And we're seeing it in this new administration big time. And they are really going down this path. So they say, you see in the headlines, the central bank's going to cure racial inequality. No. The central bank created racial inequality and the policy of printing more is going to widen racial inequality. You've got 40 years of proof, 50, progressives. 50. <laughs> empirical, unquestionable truth to verify that statement. And nobody, so what are you going to do? Nobody wants to give up their own wealth. That's the thing. That's what they're saying here. <laughs> they don't want to give up the assets that will indeed ultimately end racial inequality if they give some of the assets that should have been had by the um, you know other populations whether by race gender or other factors that were pre-1971 discriminated against